Okay, all right, Claire, over to you. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome Claire Griffiths, uh, who has attended the Radical History School in Tolpole twice now, I believe. Is that right, Claire? That's right. And uh, the last time I spoke to Claire, she was very proudly telling me that she's still got a Tolpole car parking sticker in her car because she was you know, so uh, still in delighted place, yes. to get that sticker, which is, I thought was absolutely lovely. Still in place. Claire, Claire's a great expert on... Uh, the Toll Puddle Martyrs and why the TUC chose Toll Puddle uh, to celebrate. And it's my great pleasure to hand over to Claire for the next 40 minutes. That's lovely. Thanks, uh, Les. So, um, if everyone can see the slides, okay. We don't lose too much with boxes in the corner. Um, so uh, I'm talking today about uh, Six Men of Dorset, the Toll Puddle Martyrs and the making of a legacy and I uh, begin with um, this image of the stage set for Toll Puddle as it is today or more or less today um, and of course when we refer to Toll Puddle uh, that evokes an event, a celebration, a commemoration as well as a place of course, Toll Puddle as a single word also encapsulates this historical episode and an understanding of that episode and its significance. So this is the scene as it looked in July uh, 2018, which was the last time that I was at the, uh, the Toll Puddle Festival. And the scene shows evidence, obviously, of its time. You've got the solar panels uh, in place now on the roof of the cottages. Um, the modern imagery of the martyrs on that banner over the stage. But in important ways, this is a setting which is a legacy of the 1930s, and that's a large part of what I'll be um, discussing today. And then I really like that strap line from the leaflet for uh, the rally in 1957. You've had variations on this theme for so many of the rallies and festivals since every trade unionist dreams of a visit to Toll Puddle someday. So really what I'm talking about this evening um, is some of why that comes to be, um, why Toll Puddle comes to have that particular uh, significance. Well, one of the questions which accompanied the advertising for this talk is why did the, Tol the TUC choose to remember the story of six farm workers from Toll Puddle? And one of the things I want to do this evening uh, is to think about why the TUC invested so much in this particular episode and why indeed Toll Puddle came to be considered as so central to the history of trade unionism, not just within the labour movement, but more broadly uh, taking up a position within the national narrative. And here's one example of that happening. So in April 1934, the BBC began this remarkable series of radio broadcasts which were called From Toll Puddle to TUC um, and you can see some of the kind of um, advertisement for this presenting it uh, in the Radio Times. So it was a feature for the editorial um, that week introducing this as uh, a, a new uh, departure in broadcasting because one of the things that they were planning to do was to dramatise some of this story uh, and to, to use dramatic forms in order to put that history across. So that's what we're looking at here with this advertisement for a play, The Dorsetshire Labourers, and note that terminology because that's one of the things I want us to think about this evening. Um, by R.S. Lambert, uh, this play, a dramatic interlude, um, which takes the story right through um, up until um, the return of uh, the martyrs from the transportation. So um, what was interesting about this, as, it, as the title suggests, is that this way of talking about the history of trade unionism for this national audience on this national broadcasting network um, is that Toll Puddle becomes the starting point. This is from Toll Puddle to TUC. So already in the spring of 1934, uh, you've got this sense that somehow Toll Puddle is a starting point, it's a seminal event, and it's something which is significant uh, for what becomes uh, this great national institution itself um, of the TUC. 
And this whole program, uh, the whole series of programmes from Toll Puddle to TUC was, as it was described uh, by the Radio Times, designed to give a comprehensive picture of a century of trade unionism, from the days when labourers were transported for combining to raise wages to the present day when trade unions are a recognised and important factor in the national polity. And the author of this particular dramatic interlude, Lambert, um, describes his play as dealing with, quotes, perhaps the most famous single episode in the history of British trade unionism. And he talks about how this is really made for dramatic treatment because it is unusually complete, he, ex he explains, self-contained and full of human interest. Um, it makes a better play than a talk, he says, which doesn't bode well for this evening. But anyway, we shall persist with a talk on all of this. So this most famous episode, complete self-contained. Here's another representation of Tolpuddle and what it might mean also from 1934. Uh, this is a cartoon by David Lowe, which featured in a book that many of you may know, uh, the book of the Martyrs of Tolpuddle, a remarkable volume which was published by the TUC uh, to mark the centenary of the Dorchester labourers arrest and trial. And here is Tolpuddle as a curiosity of history, with squires and judges springing from the pages of this history book to attack this rather dapper um, embodiment of trade unionism, whilst all the time this benign figure of a 19th century labourer watches over his shoulder, having seen it all before. In that same publication, George Bernard Shaw, um, in his usually acerbic uh, mode, uh, made his own contribution to the centenary commemoration uh, by seeming to undermine the whole enterprise rather. Um, he contributed a very brief comment um, to this great um, celebratory volume uh, for the commemoration uh, where he wrote simply, martyrs are a nuisance in labor movements. The business of a labor man is not to suffer but to make other people suffer until they make him reasonably comfortable. A labour agitator who gets into the hand of the police is inexcusable. There is, however, this, wrote Shaw, to be said for the Dorchester men. They got transported at the expense of their landlords and employers, as they could hardly, if they were reasonable men, have desired to live in Dorset as slaves. They were lucky to be pushed out of it. Now, that offhand summary, um, very Shavian, uh, was in complete contrast to the the overwhelming mood um, of respect and admiration which otherwise surrounded the story of Tolpuddle at that point. Um, so what I want us to think about is, is quite why that story seemed to become so important and to capture the imagination in that way. Well, this isn't a lecture about the Tolpuddle martyrs um, themselves. It's not a lecture about the 1830s, um, but it's probably as well to give a brief summary of um, this episode. Um, and there we've got an illustration again from the 1934 commemorative um, volume uh, where you see uh, the martyrs holding a meeting um, under the martyrs tree. Um, the story began um, in poverty and insecurity in early 19th century rural Dorset with very low wages in agriculture across uh, the country and with um, popular violence really bubbling um, up uh, in that period in large parts of southern England um, following the swing riots in 1830. Wages in Tolpuddle were even lower than in many of the surrounding areas and uh, farm labourers led by a Methodist lay preacher George Lovelace um, tried to speak to the employers um, to get an agreement uh, to raise uh, weekly pay by only a very modest amount. Um, but far from uh, going along with that agreement, uh, the Tolpuddle farmers reneged on it. Um, and despite appeals to the local magistrates, uh, the farm labourers were left in this very uh, difficult um, position. And it's against that background that Lovelace um, and some of his, um, his neighbours form uh, a local branch of um, of the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union. So they're forming a branch of a much larger uh, national body. So this wasn't an original action 
Uh, the Tall Potomatas are sometimes referred to erroneously as the first trade unionists, um, and uh, they uh, are sometimes treated, as that title for this slide uh, suggests, almost as though they create here um, the very um, beginnings of, of trade unionism within Toll Puddle. Uh, Toll Puddle was often uh, described in the 20th century as the cradle of trade unionism. Trade unionism already existed, and of course, the martyrs were trying to establish a branch of a larger organization rather than inventing something from scratch or trying to act in a vacuum. Trade unionism wasn't illegal uh, following the uh, repeal of the Combination Acts, um, but what enables the prosecution of uh, the Tolpud labourers was the fact that they had this initiation ceremony, swearing an oath, holding this meeting in secret. secret. Uh, and so um, the, the legal uh, powers that be wheel out uh, an opportunity um, to get them on those grounds and to um, prosecute them on that basis. Um, a spy in the ranks uh, informs on them to the local um, landowner and magistrate um, and they're arrested in February 19, 1834. Uh, taken, marched off to Dorchester where they stood trial um, and then in March of 1834 they're found guilty under the Mutiny Act on the basis of administering this illegal oath and then sentenced to seven years transportation. And um, this started a remarkable response across uh, the country of outrage and protest. Um, you have protest from some radical MPs at the time. You have a monster petition, um, which uh, it's claimed by some people, as many as 800,000 people um, had, had signed petitions um, to get the men released from what was seen very widely as a really unjust sentence, in which even the magistrate itself had said that uh, it, was, it was meant to be serve as an, an example. Um, the men are offered a conditional pardon initially and, and later a full, full pardon, and then they uh, are returned uh, to Britain. They return back um, in 1838. Um, thereafter, their history within uh, England itself is, is relatively of short duration. Five of them uh, decide that they'd be better off emigrating uh, and go off to spend the rest of their lives um, in Canada, where they made relatively little of um, this extraordinary experience that they'd been through. Uh, one of them, James Hammett, remained um, in Tolpuddle until. Uh, his death. And um, so that's the, the story in essence, that's it in a nutshell. And, and there's nothing particularly there to necessarily predetermine the elevation of these um, six men to the kind of status that they've come to enjoy, either within the heritage of the labour movement or indeed within a wider national historical narrative. And yet the fame attached to the episode has given the village of Tolpuddle this extraordinary position on the tourist map of Britain. And it's ensured that the experience of these six men um, has become one of the best known, if not always well understood episodes in early 19th century British um, history. This wasn't always so. And one of the things that I wanted to do this evening was, as my, as the title of this lecture suggested, um, to talk through a little of um, some of the complexities of actually how the Toll Puddle Martyrs come to be known as the Toll Puddle Martyrs. Um, and to point out that actually there are lots of ways in which they um, were referred to, and, um, and in some cases those um, those names persist for much longer than one might expect. So here are a few of those. Um, the Dorchester labourers, which was um, the terminology which was still most prevalent at the time of the centenary commemoration in 1934. Um, Topical martyrs does occasionally appear at an earlier date, um, including on the arch outside the Wesleyan um, Chapel. That's a chapel that post dates the time when uh, the martyrs um, were living in uh, Tolpuddle. 
um, they had worshipped at a, an old chapel which um, was derelict at, at the point of, uh, of these commemorations in the early 20th century. So on the arch outside that Methodist chapel, um, there is the inscription, Tol Pedomartus, in inverted commas, interestingly. Um, other terms that were used, the Dorsetshire labourers, that was used very widely uh, by the TUC in 1934. Um, Six men of Dorset, which I've taken for my title uh, tonight, which was also the title of a play by Harry Brooks. Um, with uh, Miles Mallison's involvement as well. Miles Mallison tends to get most of the credit for this when it's talked about. Um, and the plaque in the central hall of the Memorial Cottages in Tolpuddle um, simply remembers these six agricultural labourers of Tolpuddle. So lots of different ways in which um, they were referred to. And um, Tolpuddle itself was not a well-known location. Um, it's only really when it comes to be uh, yoked very securely to this story of uh, the experience of the uh, six men of Dorset, that Tolpuddle itself comes to be a place name that resonates and comes to be a place that people actually want to, um, to visit, to make a pilgrimage uh, in some cases. Um, even in the 1934 commemorations, then there are still many references to Dorsetshire labourers, Dorchester labourers, and so on. Um, a naming which tended to associate the trade unionists with uh, the larger county town where they'd been tried uh, and remembered them for their status as labourers rather than about any sort of martyrdom um, in uh, their uh, story. Um, and I've given you here some images of, of the ways in which the, uh, the martyrs have been uh, pictured because I think one of the other interesting things about this is about how the martyrs come together as a group and how they're thought of um, as uh, a collective. Um, the only one of the six who really had a kind of fame outside that group was George Lovelace and that's because uh, he was um, the spokesperson uh, for the group. He's someone who publishes Victims of Wiggery he publishes in his own name. So George Lovelace kind of rises out of the collective to some degree. Um, but I think the sense of um, the Tolpuddle Martyrs as these six men of Dorset, as this group, is really interesting. And you see um, that being pictured in different ways. So in the imagery from 1934, you've still got quite a lot of emphasis actually um, on, the, on the kind of sense of boiling this down to an injustice and really being faced by a, a kind of embodiment of trade unionism. So um, here on the medal, uh, which was struck, and you can see there the original um, design for that, which is on display um, in the Martyrs Museum in Tolpuddle. Um, you can see there um, watch it, this man watching um, ship uh, sailing away the six um, stars representing the martyrs in, uh, in the sky um, and they are still being uh, recycled for the 150th anniversary in 1984 um, an illustration which is taken directly from the TUC's 1934 commemoration uh, of these figures of the establishment uh, stereotyped uh, images uh, in their, uh, in their uh, uh, stove hats and um, and in the judicial robes um, there in the back of the backdrop to a single uh, man who is in chains um, and having to confront um, this victimization. Um, but of course, the notion of trying to represent all six of the men and trying to uh, establish that sense of the significance of them as a collective is something that I think has become um, you know, arguably more prominent um, recent years. I think it's very interesting that Clifford Harf Harper's really striking um, illustration that's used um, so much by um, the TUC and on the Martyrs um, Museum in Tolpuddle now. Um, this is a ubiquitous image. Um, and it's interesting that in a way, I would argue that really the men are made quite homogenous here. And it, and it really is very much emphasizing that sense of uh, the six of them and, you know, all in the same, in the same boat and, and really getting away from that kind of differentiation 
um, of the significance of Lovelace, George Lovelace in particular. Um, so just to run through some of the ways then in which this um, episode begins to kind of take shape as an historical episode. Um, and these are some of the ways in which one uh, as remembered Tolpuddle, if only someone had written an article with that um, as a title, Remembering Tolpuddle. Um, so 1834, obviously this is the, the, the trial, and I've also put down there the demonstration at Copenhagen Fields, and you'll see that um, that's mirrored at the bottom of um, the slide with um, the events, really a lot of effort put into um, commemorating uh, that demonstration. Uh, in recent years, and particularly from two, 2009, marking the 175th um, anniversary. But you can see that um, from uh, even in 1838, there's uh, an attempt to uh, fate the men as they return, a dinner's put on for them uh, in London by the committee that had raised such a lot of money in order to uh, promote their, uh, their cause and to try and resettle them and to and settle them on farms that they uh, take up in Essex for a while, um, trying to uh, put right some of the disruption um, to their lives that have been caused by this injustice. But there's then from the 1870s that you begin to get um, some sense of the labour movement trying to um, trying to mark the significance of the Tolpuddle Martyrs and um, to celebrate uh, the life of the one martyr who still remained um, in Britain, in England, indeed in Tolpuddle. Um, but it's interesting that it's the Agricultural Labourers Union um, that was responsible for presenting uh, Hammett with an engraved watch and uh, there's later an, an effort um, to, um, to mark uh, Hammett's grave as we'll see in the um, the centenary commemorations. But it's interesting that this really begins with the agricultural um, union. Um, and I think there are two parallel stories really, which don't always coincide about the way in which Tolpuddle is remembered um, by agricultural trade unionists um, and indeed remembered um, within um, the Southwest region. Um, and then the story of how it becomes taken up as a national event uh, and embraced uh, by the TUC. And those two um, claims on the martyrs, if you like, are sometimes uh, rather in tension. I mentioned already the memorial arch that's put up um, outside the Methodist chapel in 1912 with Tolpuddle Martyrs in inverted commas um, uh, engraved into it. Um, and that's really the first occasion that you have a sense of making a commemorative landscape in Tolpuddle something that the TUC comes to uh, invest in. Uh, 1932, uh, there's a resolution at Congress um, pledging uh, the trade union movement to mark uh, the upcoming centenary. There'd been a previous resolution in 1922, and it looks as though someone might've got the date wrong and got a bit confused. Uh, but anyway, from 1932, there's a lot of planning that goes um, into marking uh, the centenary, thinking about how best to do this, what might be a good permanent memorial, what the educational um, work would be um, to accompany this great effort. Um, and there are some wonderful uh, files for all of this in the TUC's um, papers. And one of the big movers within this was Walter Citrine. And um, he some became labelled by some people his nickname Walter Tolpuddle Citrine because he becomes rather obsessed by um, by marking this um, this centenary puts a great deal of effort into it so in 1934 um, Congress uh, goes to hold its annual meeting in Weymouth and that's preceded by four days of commemorative events in Dorset an area which was um, at this point notoriously um, problematic for um, both the, the Labour Party and uh, trade unionism in terms of uh, getting membership and, and, and putting organisation in place. So it has this other function really as, as being a, um, a kind of mission uh, activity to try and win over um, the, uh, the workers of Dorset. Um, so 1934 um, puts in place uh, a lot of commemorative features of Tolpuddle as we recognize it um, today, plaques are put up, there's a bench put up, 
the cottages are built. Um, and that sense of, um, of making a kind of memorial landscape is I think very important, uh, important legacy from 34. But in, in the sense of the rally and the annual festival, it's really only from 1946 onwards that that begins to take shape as an important feature in Labour's summer calendar. And again, the agricultural union's really important in, um, in promoting that. Uh, 1984, the 150th anniversary, gave a real fillip to um, the promotion of the story of Tolpuddle um, because it coincided with this uh, terrible kind of series of events, you know, Thatcherism at its height, GCHQ, all sorts of, um, of things to rally around. And so I think Tolpuddle at that point becomes um, a, a, an anniversary that you can throw lots of other things onto and, and associate um, the kind of problems of the past with um, the challenges of, of the present um, and make a, a convincing narrative out of all of that. Um, but there were some convincing narratives in 1934 uh, too. And um, here is the, uh, a, an extract from the closing speech that Walter Citrine made as General Secretary at TUC um, uh, following this great uh, of series of events in which he put so much uh, investment. Um, it said there have been some concerns that we were getting out of focus, that we were getting out of perspective. Um, but he argued we have to advertise trade unionism. We cannot advertise trade unionism better than by bringing to bold relief the sacrifices made for that movement. We cannot live on our history, I admit, but what we have to try to do is to use heroic examples in order to impress upon the mind of the present generation the necessity for the continuation of those sacrifices. That is the purpose of Tolpuddle, and that's why we've tried to do it uh, thoroughly. And there you've got one of the um, designs for uh, commemorative materials from, um, this is the, from the um, leaflet, the handbook really, um, for uh, the uh, Tolpuddle commemorations. Um, and there you've got uh, the men in their broken chains uh, leading the procession followed by um, present day uh, trade unionists. And um, well, some of the kind of things that were um, going on in Tolpuddle uh, itself uh, in 1934, and you can see um, the full uh, set of, of images um, here, just as a kind of, you know, illustration of some of the kind of things that were going on and and to suggest if you look at that bottom uh, left hand uh, uh, photograph this is about this um, uh, memorial bench that was being uh, unveiled the shelter um, that uh, uh, had been uh, built as part of marking the centenary um, just look at those crowds and and the thing about this is that really this was ex absolutely exceeding um, the TUC's expectation. Um, they'd limited what was going on in Tolpuddle to a single day um, in these commemorative events running up to the Weymouth Congress. Um, and Tolpuddle was pretty difficult to get to. Tolpuddle is pretty difficult to get to. Um, so I think there was just an expectation that not many people would turn up and it could be a bit embarrassing. Um, but actually lots of people come and all the coverage, all the press coverage of these events emphasised just how moving the, um, the Tolpuddle um, experience had, had been. Um, and there at the top, uh, um, Citrine flanked by um, the, uh, the first set of inhabitants uh, to the memorial cottages, these cottages for uh, retired um, workers. Um, in terms of of these events then, there's a whole timetable of lots of different things going on. In the previous slide, you can see some of the kind of pageantry of dressing up, mixing uh, past and present and you know, enjoying the idea of having people wandering around in costume from the early 19th century. Um, lots of things like that, but also, as you can see, there's lots of sport going on, lots of kind of competitions. Um, so this really was a, a labour festival. It wasn't something which was um, solely uh, themed around uh, the history of the Tolpuddle episode um, itself. And you can see there from this poster um, where we're being encouraged to 
uh, head to Dorchester. Head to Dorchester, no, so much of this is going on in Dorchester. Um, where you could be a play on a play stage, there'll be sports, athletics, a pageant, band contests, uh, so much to enjoy. The dedication of the memorial is actually quite a uh, small print on that poster um, as a whole. Um, and here are the cottages um, that are so familiar today as that backdrop to uh, the festival and the location for um, the current uh, museum. Uh, and the TUC was very proud of these and proud of the fact that the memorial in which they were investing took this form. It was something practical, it was something that was going to do good, it was setting a standard for workers' housing, uh, it was lit by electricity. Everything about it was modern and positive. Um, they had a few problems making sure that they had trade union labour um, working on building these cottages. There were a few um, hiccups along the way, but the emphasis on this as a really fitting memorial for the labour movement as something really positive as an investment um, to uh, celebrate uh, the martyrs whilst contributing um, to uh, the conditions of people living uh, in uh, Dorset in the present day. Um, and one of the other really important elements, perhaps ultimately the most important element, of the centenary commemorations was the publication of this book, uh, this lovely volume, The Book of the Martyrs of um, Tollpuddle. And you can see just the kind of care that went into this, their colour prints, it's beautiful typography, um, so much effort put into making this a really lavish uh, volume. Um, it's kind of checklist of all those who are contributing to it, you know, Stafford Cripps writes for it, G. Cole writes for it. Um, this, you know, it's it's really um, an opportunity um, to put together lots of the documentary material. Um, so it's kind of sense that this is a scholarly volume, but then also um, articles which are um, sort of reflecting on the meaning of uh, of this story. But the, the real emphasis was this as a piece of scholarship, something that showed that the TUC wasn't just making up its history or, or making a sort of mythology, uh, but what it was actually doing was investing in um, really getting to the bottom of this as an historical episode and giving it much greater um, prominence. Um, and I think the importance of uh, this book uh, shouldn't be understated, actually. Uh, you know, so we've got all sorts of people contributing to the Hammonds, um, uh, Webbs, you know, it, it really is something that um, was uh, recognised widely at the time as being um, a scholarly work and an important um, work. Nonetheless, um, these, there we go, yes, <laughs> well done Les. <laughs> the show and tell, I've got a show and tell here as well, but I'm, I've not got the dust jacket on mine, I've got the nice leather volume, the presentation volume here. Um, so, uh, late, re more recently, historians have been rather more sceptical about the emphasis um, that the TUC gave in telling the story of Tollpuddle and particularly some of the kind of accretions that have come to the story and these kind of assumptions that actually um, the martyrs were significant and um, that really that's the story about the 1830s um, that should um, be celebrated. Um, and even in 1934, you had um, some historians um, and uh, activists who were uh, anxious that actually this was a way for the TUC to adopt some thoroughly respectable um, trade unionists, uh, rather than recognising that actually there was a lot of, uh, of much more uh, violent protest going on at the time. Um, and so in a way, taking these uh, seemingly rather kind of helpless uh, figures, they do come to be known as martyrs after all, and um, they're sort of caught up um, suffering um, against these, the pressure of the establishment uh, and they don't lift a finger to hurt anybody. Um, they're just trying to help their families and um, they are, most of them, um, actually notable as um, men of faith uh, as well. You've got very significant overlap in particular um, with Methodism amongst this group of uh, trade unionists. Um, so everything seemed to make them very, very respectable heroes to be celebrating uh, from the past. And that's one of the contentious things 
um, that has emerged within this story. Um, so Citrine was keen to make this a story which had meaning for um, trade unionists in the 1930s. And of course, it wasn't difficult to uh, find uh, the significance about uh, the dangers that faced attempts to organize um, in the 1930s. Um, and so against that backdrop of what was going on in continental Europe in particular, but also um, fears about um, political extremes at home as well in Britain, um, lots of ways in which that immediate context um, provided uh, a particular significance to what was being marked in 1934. And here's Citrine again uh, talking about how um, this episode was an inspiration and a warning um, and emphasizing some of the kind of, of things that one could learn from the top of the moss, which again is really emphasizing that notion about what good virtuous people uh, these early trade unionists were. Um, it's about sacrifice, it's about um, devotion, um, and that what they were fighting for was actually um, to preserve liberties, and that emphasis on freedom is something that comes out um, again uh, and uh, again um, in the way in which they're being spoken about uh, in the 1930s. So, um, just to sort of round up, there's um, um, lots that more that one could talk about, and I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities for us to pick some of that up in um, in questions. But just to think about um, where all this um, takes us, and, and quite what that legacy of uh, the Toll Puddle Martyrs um, actually means. Um, I think what's quite remarkable about um, this episode is, in part, that uh, association with a martyrdom, and that's something I've written about um, recently in a book of essays which was all about exploring this notion of um, secular uh, martyrdom. Les has probably got that to hand as well, but I shall just give a little plug for that volume too. Um, so a collection of, uh, of essays which takes the whole notion of secular martyrdom right through um, from Peterloo um, up to uh, the present. So I think that notion of, of how an idea of the martyrdom of the Tall Puddle um, Six comes um, to take shape is very interesting. But I think the whole way in which Tall Puddle seems to have this kind of emotive force uh, for the labour movement, but also within a national um, narrative on a most more, much more general level is really interesting. Um, in 1934, the TUC was trying to raise the uh, the profile of this as an episode within the history of the labour movement and to provide that sense of an inspiration for present day trade unionists. What I think they didn't realise was quite how by turning the spotlight on Toll Puddle in that way and through publishing the book and so on, actually this would contribute to um, a much greater profile for Toll Puddle within the national story as well. Um, so an episode which is both on one level kind of deeply politicized also becomes something which can be strangely apolitical um, within uh, that sort of national uh, narrative. And I think one of the reasons that that is able to happen and that you tell people can kind of straddle both those um, identifications, both those associations, um, is partly about the place, partly about the location for this story. Um, I think it was um, at the time of the centenary commemorations and continues to be for so many people who make that pilgrimage um, today and who go to um, the, the festival, whatever it is that attracts them to the festival, whether it's the Toll Puddle Martyrs at Essence or whether it's coming to the Radical History School uh, or whether it's the musical acts or whether it's just being at a festival. Um, so many reasons to be there. Um, but I think one of the, the things that has had a particular grasp on people is just that kind of sense that so many of those visiting Toll Puddle come from very, very different places. And I think particularly in the 1930s, there was a real sense 
of, for trade unionists seeming to rediscover these ancestors of trade unionism, but finding them in a place which itself seemed to many of those visitors actually to be part of the past. It was like kind of going back uh, into this, uh, this other world, this um, pre-industrial um, world. So I think there's something about the location, something about um, the way that this is a, an opportunity for trade unionism um, to celebrate the essence of the movement and yet um, to do that uh, in a place which is somehow removed uh, in time and space. I think that's part of, of the power. I think Tull Puddle also has that extraordinary kind of emotive charge that it almost operates like a fable. It becomes a story which is about extremes, about was good and evil about uh, the kind of the powerless and the powerful. Um, it really is a kind of story of these polarities. Um, and it's interesting going back to Lambert and his dramatization, his dramatic interlude, which we saw in one of the first slides in this talk. Um, Lambert uh, did say that in producing this dramatic interlude uh, for the BBC, it was all true to the facts but some of it was a bit dramatised and one of the things that he had dramatised was to make um, anyone who had any kind of landed um, power or any kind of legal authority um, just a little bit more villainous than they probably were. Um, so Lambert was conscious of that sense of, you know, in dramatising this, part of what you do is, is uh, emphasise that uh, kind of um, polarity. Um, and I do like this um, quotation from that wonderful collection of, of um, comments that just I think I think it's such a, a brilliant book actually what what Talford means to you that um, just gathering together people's response to uh, the experience of time they've spent at Tull Puddle and their kind of response to the story but I do like this contribution because it does kind of pull us up and um, I can't help wondering uh, is this all we've got the commemoration of what was frankly a defeat for labour organisation at that time and, and that, of course, the other thing about Toll Puddle, you know, these, there's, there's no continuity from uh, this story, even within agricultural trade unionism. Um, it's 40 years down the line uh, before you've got trade union organisation uh, in that part of Dorset again, or indeed, basically anywhere in, in, uh, in Britain, pretty much. Um, so this isn't a story about something that at that point is founded and about a continuous tradition. Um, it really is a story of um, uh, a failure and all the kind of pathos uh, around the experience of, uh, of the martyrs at that time. And the story in some ways to celebrate, I would argue, is actually the story of what was going on at Copenhagen Fields and with the protests and the petitions. Um, and the fact that this story about these six men did manage to, to demonstrate just quite what a an extent of trade unionism there was and, and what sympathy there was amongst um, the radical cause uh, at that period and how that um, could uh, be mobilized. So that's that, Les. Thank you, Claire. Do you want to stop sharing your screen now? That was brilliant yes, as absolutely. normal. You blow, my, you blow my socks off again. Every time I hear the, you talk about these issues, you, uh, you blow my socks off. It's really, really interesting. Um, there are a couple of questions, but I want to bring I want to bring Nigel in. I'm hoping Nigel's going to come in and show us a couple of pictures uh, from the 1912 celebrations. Is that oh, right, brilliant. Nigel? Or just yeah. Light? Um, yes. Uh, hello again, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Claire. That was fascinating. Um, uh, we've recently came to light some photographs, which I think are the earliest photographs we have of the events uh, from 1912 in Tolpuddle. Uh, including what was must be the first march procession um, through through the village. Um, it's a oh, shame we can't really see what's wow, on the banner. Yeah. It's been washed out. Wow. But um, the uh, the unveiling of the um, the the arch must have also included this procession. Mm. Um, so. so uh, Sure. Can I just the, the arch was the arch was actually paid for by a Methodist Claire, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah. Methodists uh, yeah. actually wanted to build some cottages themselves, and they didn't have enough money, so they put the money they saved into building the arch. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that's with, another fantastic picture. I mean, interestingly, the original um, uh, appeal back in uh, 1908 was to raise money for some cottages. That's um, right. Yeah. That's and they said, didn't yeah. raise enough yeah. money for the cottages, so they put the art shop instead. Um, and it wasn't until yeah. 1934 that the TUC sort of fulfilled that promise of actually yeah. building some cottages for retiring uh, farm workers. Yeah. But I think this whole Methodist heritage for the martyrs is really interesting as well. And that, and that seems to have, have ramped up again in, in recent years, you know, that this sense of, of Tullpuddle as a place that's on the oh. sort of Methodist uh, historical map um, and really claiming the story in particular ways. And it's very interesting, some of the kind of epithets that are given um, to the martyrs and the way they're described by trade unionists, the way they're described by um, Methodists. There, you know, there are different ways in which um, the story can, I suppose, be spun, but just the kind of what you really want to, to celebrate in, in these men and their experience. The, um, there is a question about the term toll puddle martyrs. When was it first used? Who coined it? And was the term martyrs contested? Well, it, it, appears, it appears on the arch in 1912. Um, and I think that's the first time it's really used toll puddle martyrs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you, you get this language of victimhood before then. So Loveless himself refers to them as the victims of Whiggery and there's a kind of discussion about them as victims, um, which implies a certain kind of um, powerlessness that perhaps martyrdom doesn't. Martyrdom implies that you are um, complicit in this in a sense that, you know, you are, um, uh, you are part of making, you're part of uh, making a stand and uh, in a sense, it, it gives them a little bit more of an active role in the story. Um, but really, it's it's in the process in the early 1930s of, of getting that commemoration together that martyrs emerges as one of the ways in which um, they're being spoken about, um, but by no means as the dominant one. I mean, I think it's very interesting, that whole sense of the Book of the Martyrs of Tolpuddle, which I think is, you know, it's like, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know, it's, um, so I think there's a sort of reference there. Um, but, but most of the publicity for those events in 1934 doesn't talk about them as martyrs at all. They're laborers and men, um, Philip, but they're, Philip, not, they're not martyrs. Sorry, Claire. Philip, interesting, has put out the, T, the TUC volume in 1934, scarcely mentions Methodism. There's only one reference to it in the index, yeah. so that's that one. Nigel, do you want to take this question I, from Anne? I'm sorry I was called around the phone, but I might have missed this. Can you tell me why the toll martyrs were pardoned so early in their sentences? Okay, but before I answer, try and answer that question, I think it's fascinating that the the volume of the the TUC uh, martyrs included a contribution from uh, George George Bernard Shaw. They must have asked him to invite uh, to to supply something. Yeah. in the belief that a, a famous author would write something nice. And he says, I'm afraid I cannot say anything in praise of the Dorchester martyrs. Martyrs are a nuisance in labour movements. The business of a labour man is not to suffer, but to make other people suffer until they make him reasonably comfortable. <laughs> and, and you just get the feeling, I mean, you can just imagine opening that envelope when Bernard Shaw's contribution turns up and thinking, well, I guess we have to include it since we invited him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, to answer, <laughs> to answer the question. George Bernard Shaw. I mean, to answer the question, um, I mean, I think there was a sense of irritation by the government, I, I sense, that won't this campaign go away? Yeah. And the legal arguments about, well, if it was unlawful for farm workers to take a secret oath, what about the Orange Order or the Masons? And even members of the royal family had taken uh, secret oaths. So um, uh, there was not just the public pressure of petitioning that was seemingly not going away, but also MPs constantly getting up in Parliament asking these awkward questions and um, yeah. so they, there was this free pardon uh, and most significantly I think is the, a return home because yeah. the government did try and buy off Loveless by 
promising to send his wife to Australia and to set them set them up as free free a free family in Australia and of course Loveless refused. And I think that's what that picture's about, isn't it? The picture of the man watching the ship yeah. sailing is Loveless watching that ship go because he was he was in Tasmania waiting for yeah. Betsy to arrive and had to wait for a ship to come in and go back again to make sure that she wasn't actually on that ship. Yeah. Otherwise uh, he would have left her in Tasmania while he was coming back. So I think that's a that's a very clever picture. Yeah. of the Southern Cross representing the six martyrs as well. And it's really excellent. Uh, Rosemary asks, is there a connection between the martyrs and Chartism? Well, that's one of the other things that isn't really emphasised a great deal in the commemorations. And of course, that's one of the, um, the other things that uh, more recent historians have criticised about the way in which this episode has been um, remembered. Um, there are some connections, um, uh, the Lovelaces have some connections with um, Chartism, uh, but on the whole that kind of sense of being part of some wider politicised radical culture um, is not something that's kind of emphasised in the way the story is told, I would suggest. They when they the poem when they... that George Loveless uh, hands uh, hands to somebody as he is taken out of the the prison, uh, we will, we will, we will be yeah. free. The famous poem. Um, he wasn't the actual author of it, um, and we believe that the first time that it's sort of seen is at a Chartist demonstration in Birmingham. So clearly, George Loveless was not only uh, very much aware of Chartism. But, but but memorizing the poem yeah. uh, to a remarkable I I don't think I could memorize a poem like that and write it down and hand it on a piece of paper mm. um so and he did when he came back he did speak at various chartist events yeah. so yeah. there are different... I was, that's what I was going to say in, yeah. when they were in Essex when they had the two farms in Essex people in Essex complained that uh Lovelace and the other martyrs were there were holding chartist meetings, which apparently had grown so large they could no longer have them in their own rooms. They were having them outside in a field next door to the farmhouse. So that we, we know, I think, that they were involved in chartist meetings in Essex and probably organised chartist meetings in Essex. Yeah. So there is, there is, there is a link. Uh, but interestingly enough, of course, as soon as they go off to Canada, that's all forgotten. And they keep everything very, very quiet in Canada. Uh, and, and you didn't mention, did you, that one of the things in 1934 was they brought some of the earth from the grave of Lovelace yeah. back from yeah. Canada to put onto the grave of Hammett yeah. to make that association between Canada and Tolpuddle. Uh, another question from Robin Gray, do you think we should try to elevate the Ascot Martyrs to a similar level of notability? Is it their 150th anniversary in 2023? Perhaps that's one for us, Les, because uh, yeah, you and I, I have discussed this. We would like to yeah, have... Yeah, yeah. We'd like to have one of these sessions devoted to the Ascot Martyrs, and so we would. Yeah, any uh, recommendations as to who we uh, might like to invite would be gratefully received. Yeah. And they would be absolutely. To answer the question um, about the teaching, unfortunately, the Tolpuddle Martyrs are not taught in schools anymore. They used to be. No, I used to um, teach it. Yeah. We we try and do our best to plant the story of trade unionism in the minds of young people through the story of Top of the Martyrs without it appearing that trade unions are just about a history lesson. You know, we're yeah. constantly so, so I, I doing hope relevant answer to your question, should I make, okay, is that okay? We've done that one. Uh, do you think having the, do you think naming the Martyrs is connected to them being made part of an English radical tradition alongside cause of historic characters who died for the cause, like Watt Tyler and John Ball? Anything oh, I, missed that, the, I missed the first part of that, Les. What was? It was about whether there's a connection between people who have died for the cause, like Tyler and Ball. Yeah. Uh, I've just deleted the question, so I'm sorry about that. But it's about whether or not that, that that term martyrs was used to refer back to people like Tyler and Ball. Yes, I think so because you know part of this is about establishing, as you see through a lot of the kind of pageantry in the labour movement in this period in the 19th, in the early 20th century, you have this kind of sense of almost an sort of unbroken chain of, uh, of connection, people who essentially born in different places and different times, but still share that kind of same spirit. 
And I think that emphasis on spirit, and also that's part of why I think you have this emphasis on the particular kind of virtues that the Talpadal Martyrs stood for, that what you, you can make this is a story about freedom and a story about a fight for freedom, um, rather than quite so much um, fighting for particular trade union rights and and your wages and opportunities in the workplace. Um, so that kind of more generalized sense does help to connect them to people who are not themselves trade unionists, um, but could be seen as being part of this ongoing sort of radical tradition. Um, I, we're, we're running out of time. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Claire, you held that book up of essay so quickly. I'm going to give you a chance to plug it again. Okay. The book well, is just- I don't think there's any point in plugging it. No one can- no, no one in their right mind can afford to buy this um, as, oh, well, as the most academic books, but, um, but it is a jolly interesting. Secular Martyrs. Book. Okay. Is it dreadfully expensive then, is it? Yeah, they're... Far too expensive for a retired person like me, obviously. <laughs> Claire, you've been absolutely great. We've had a great evening uh, and I just thought you were captivating again and I'm sure uh, looking at the comments, people have uh, learned an awful lot tonight about uh, the top other martyrs and the reasons why the TUC chose them. I'd love, I wish we had some more time. Maybe another time we can talk about the lovers that moved in and supposedly attacked his neighbour with a shovel. Yeah, that would be quite interesting. Story. There are lots of brilliant <laughs> stories. But I always learn a lot <laughs> from these <laughs> sessions because I feel people know such a lot, you know, from different parts of the story and involved in the, the rallies and the festivals. So I always find it was really it, was it, is it true that they didn't actually want to build the cottages in Tolpala to start with? They actually wanted to build them in Dorchester to start oh, with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? Dorchester, it's amazing this story isn't all about Dorchester. Yeah, so, exactly. Very quickly, to answer, down, you know? Sorry, to answer David's question that's just popped up about were other events considered, there were some controversy in 1930s about the choice of Tolpala. This is a book. Um, oh, brilliant. The Alan Hutt. Written yes, by Alan great. Hutt. Uh, who became a f fairly famous journalist in, mm -hmm. in his own right, but it, it, for the Communist Party, he wrote this story condemning the decision or criticising the decision and saying that the TUC should have chosen other examples, such as the um, the pickets who burnt down a, a Glasgow mill that killed some... Lot of strikers, yeah. um, um, and then there was another book written at the same time, an impartial appreciation of the toll pedal martyrs. This mm. basically says what they martyrs, they knew exactly what they were doing. They got first class um, voyage to Australia and they were treated really well. And loads of people got free pardons. So what's all the fuss about? It? <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, have you got the advert for the next session, which is going to be on April the 11th, is it? I think I've forgotten the date of the next session. Um, uh, so I apologise for this. I I have. If you give me a just a second, it looks like a very That's interesting. Be about the of D. Um, I know. I know. Oh, we have a few people on here from. Uh, oh, I, said, no, I saw them. I saw them. Tuesday, the thirteenth of April, seven thirty. Oh yes. The miners, the miners strike in the Forest of Dean. Thank you, Innes. Hang on. For rescuing right. Nigel and I. <laughs> Yes, um, I mean, although it's focused on the Forest of Dean um, uh, and the lockout, this was a national lockout uh, whose anniversary is coming up. So it's a good moment to remember the miners lockout of 1921. Um, and Ian has written a particular account using the, the story of the Forest of Dean, a great photograph of them uh, in a place called Pillowell. But I'm sure Ian will have more Similar photographs. Please join us in April. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I'd just like to say I did used to teach the toll puddle of martyrs until the national curriculum came in and Mr. Baker took it away. He just said we were not allowed to teach it anymore. Unbelievable. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Claire, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Nigel, for all your help. And I look forward to seeing you Thank all you, on the 13th of April. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Good night. Good night.